Hello, everyone. <laughs> we'll just give everybody a minute to get in here before we start. Hope everyone is having a fantastic day. Happy Monday. Yes, happy Monday. At least it's almost finished Monday. It's not Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> it could be worse. Yes. <laughs> um, here in central Alberta, we're having crazy weather and wind storms. So if anyone's in central Alberta right now, I'm sure you're experiencing it too. It's, it's wild. That doesn't sound like much fun. I think it's 15 degrees outside in Kelowna today, so I won't complain. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. I was gonna complain we have rain rather than the sun we had yesterday, but yeah, no, not complaining <laughs> now. <laughs> okay, well, I think we will get started now. So hello everyone and welcome to Beyond the Runway, a look behind the scenes of commercial aviation of Elevate Aviation's virtual cross country tour live from Kelowna. We are so excited to have you join us today and can't wait for you to hear from our speaker lineup about their amazing careers in aviation. We acknowledge that we are speaking from the traditional territory of the Silks Okanagan Nation. Elevate Aviation has programs all across Canada that educate people about aviation careers and provide support to those who need it. You can view all of our programs on our website at www.elevateaviation.ca. There you'll find information on our Elevate Aviation Learning Center, mentorship and bursary programs, our airtime webinars, and of course, this year's virtual cross-country tour. The cross-country tour started back in 2015 to showcase the many careers available and the paths one can take to join the exciting world of aviation. This year, we are excited to present the tour virtually. We hope you enjoy the presentation today and ask any questions that you may have. You can use the Q&A feature within Zoom webinar at the bottom of the screen, and the moderator will compile the questions throughout the speaker's presentations. At the end of all the presentations, our moderator, Katie, who is the British Columbia Ambassador for Elevate Aviation and a Flight Service Specialist at NAV Canada, will present the frequently asked or most unique questions to the speakers during the Q&A session. To start off, my name is Hannah Duffield and I'm the British Columbia Community Lead for Elevate Aviation. Outside of Elevate, I work as a structural aircraft maintenance engineer here in Kelowna at KF Aerospace. For a quick intro, that means I perform all the structural maintenance that allows planes to keep flying. This includes repairing anything from sheet metal to composites to wooden fabric and many more items in between. Now enough about me. I would like to introduce you to our first amazing speaker of the day, Ashley Dillon, who is an air traffic operations specialist at NAV Canada. Take it away, Ashley. All right, thank you, Hannah. So hi, I'm Ashley, and I'm excited to share my story with you. I'm going to start off with some song lyrics from Magnetized by Tom O'Dell. See these birds going across the sky, 3,000 miles they fly. How do they know which way to go? Somehow they always seem to know. Seems kind of random, but the first time that I heard these lyrics, I instantly related to them. As a kid, I often wondered about this, but instead of birds, it was airplanes for me. I was always fascinated by them. I grew up in Abbotsford. The Abbotsford Air Show was, and still is, my favorite weekend of the year, and it's what sparked my interest in aviation. But it went beyond just the performance side. I remember as a kid sitting outside with my dad, watching various airplanes high overhead, and us wondering and discussing where they were going, how they knew where to go, and picturing an imaginary road map in the sky. It was a field that I was always excited by, but one I did not initially pursue. I originally went to school to be a teacher. It was in my final semester contemplating the practicum year, but had come to realize that it wasn't my passion. Thankfully, it was around this time that I heard about NAV Canada and I have not looked back since. NAV Canada is Canada's air navigation service provider and it deals with air traffic control, flight information, aeronautical publications and notices and technology innovation. I've been with the company for almost six years now and in my time here, I've done a variety of jobs. When most people think of the company, they think of air traffic control. And that is how I started my journey here. I was originally in training to be an IFR, which stands for Instrument Flight Rules, 
en route air traffic controller at the Vancouver Area Control Centre in Surrey, BC. The operations floor here is divided into five different sectors, each with their own responsibilities that cover the entire flight, Vancouver flight information region. The sector I was training in primarily dealt with the sequencing of aircraft landing in Vancouver. There are three phases to the training process, a generic course, a specialty course, and then on the job training. In the generic course, students learn the overall rules involved in air traffic control and become familiar with the manual of air traffic services. There are written exams as well as a practical application of the rules and procedures learned using a generic simulator, which is based off of fake airspace and uses voice recognition. Next is the specialty course where students learn the specific rules and procedures for the sector that they are training for. They also move on to the specialty simulator, which they, uh, sorry, lost my spot, uh, where they are using technology that's modeled off of the technology you actually use on the operations floor. And they're also speaking to an actual person rather than using voice recognition, but I'll touch on that later. There are written and practical exams during this phase too. From there, the student moves on to on-the-job training where they are working live traffic with an instructor who's also plugged in with them, overseeing that everything is going smoothly with the goal that the student will progress to the ability to be able to work the traffic without any guidance from the instructor. I had made it this far and was about a year into my training and a month into my on-the-job training when I suffered a concussion, which forced me to put a pause on my training. After taking time off to recover, I was able to return to work, but chose not to pursue further ATC training at that point. Instead, I came back as an operational training specialist. These specialists, or OTS, are responsible for the simulation portion of the ATC training. At the generic stage, the OTS primarily deal with troubleshooting. Troubleshooting is a simulation runs aren't running properly. However, they are very heavily involved in the specialty course portion. The biggest part of their job is the delivery of the simulation runs. When students are controlling the aircraft, it is the OTS that both respond back to the student as the pilot, as well as enter the command into their computer so the corresponding aircraft follows accordingly on the student screen as well, such as climbing or descending, adjusting their speed, or changing their direction. It's kind of like playing a video game all day, so it's kind of fun. In addition to the delivery, the OTS are also the ones who create and program these simulation runs, which involves a great deal of coordination with the instructors who are also controllers, who are trying to replicate various situations they have seen on the operations floor as a training tool. This is an extremely time consuming process and requires precision and patience. It also involves a great deal of last minute edits as seen fit by the instructors, as well as troubleshooting when necessary. The main focus and goal of an operational training specialist is to try to create as realistic a product as possible for the students to optimize their training. I worked in this role for a year and a half and thoroughly enjoyed it. Personally, I found it extremely interesting to see the other side of the simulation process after having gone through the specialty course myself. Following this, I was presented with the opportunity for a job in my current role, an air traffic operations specialist or ATOS. As much as I enjoyed my time as an operational training specialist, the appeal of being closer to the operation again was enough to apply for this role. The training for ATOS involves a course portion, which lasts about three months, followed by on-the-job training. The main responsibilities involved in ATOS are to help process data, flight, data and flight plans for control operations, as well as coordinate search and rescue for IFR aircraft. The most frequent task we do is the monitoring of IFR flight plans and making sure that the flight plans that we have in the systems that we use for air traffic control, which is called CATS, the Canadian Automated Air Traffic Services, are up to date with the right information and that they are profiling correctly for the controllers. We will often receive calls or messages providing updated information, such as departure times, filed altitude changes, or a change in the aircraft and civil registration, to name a few. This information can be coordinated by dispatch for the airline, the tower or area controller, or sometimes the pilot themselves. If controllers are having difficulty accessing the flight plan, or it seems like there is a discrepancy with the information on the plan and what the aircraft is actually doing, they will call us to look into it and fix it. We are also responsible for processing and disseminating any data that may impact the control operations. Most notably, this would be dealing with NOTAMs or notice to airmen. These are notices that contain information that is crucial, such as equipment outages, runway closures, restricted airspace for things such as military operations, paragliding, or a special event like an air show. And I know myself, I was very excited to process the air show one because it just meant more to me. 
and hazards such as forest fires. When we receive a NOTAM, we process it by determining which part of the airspace is impacted and then pass on that information accordingly. The coordination of search and rescue for IFR aircraft is an extremely important part of the job. The default amount of time allotted for search and rescue is one hour, meaning that an aircraft that is either an hour past their estimated time of departure or arrival is officially considered to be overdue at that point. We are prompted before that, the 45 minute mark for departures and the 30 minute mark for arrivals, that something may be overdue and we start looking into the flight plan at that point. For overdue departures, we first check the point of departure. If it involves an open control tower, such as YVR, alerting is not required, but we may call the tower to get an updated departure time. If there is no open control tower at the location, we will try to contact the pilot or the company, check the flight history for any additional information or contact the nearest facility and may request a field search. For aircraft that are proposed to be overdue arrivals, we first check to see if they are still actually airborne on the radar feed. If they are not on the radar feed, we coordinate with the controllers that would have been speaking to the aircraft for any information. We will also try to call the pilot or the arrival site. In the case for both overdue departures and arrivals, if we have exhausted all of our resources and have still come up with nothing and we are reaching the overdue status of an hour, we then pass on whatever information we have to the JRCC, the Joint Rescue Coordination Center, which is a unit responsible for organizing both aeronautical and maritime search and rescue operations. I absolutely love being an air traffic operations specialist. I enjoy that there are so many aspects to the job that are each unique from one another. It involves a lot of problem solving and coordination, which always keeps things interesting. I still find it extremely surreal that I get to work in a field that I've had an interest in since I was a young girl. I only wish I had known how vast the industry is back then and the variety of jobs that are involved in aviation. Three jobs I've had with NAV Canada are jobs I had no clue even existed back then, and they are just the beginning of potential careers both within the company and the field in general. Now you can check navcanada.ca to see the broad scope that the company covers. I'm beyond excited to be part of an event that helps to promote this. I feel like I have come full circle. Now, when I sit outside and see an airplane, I have enough background knowledge that I can determine some facts about it. And for everything else, I now have the resources to check, which I find pretty neat and it still fascinates me to this day. Thank you. That was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, I would now like to welcome Laura Mortensen, who currently works as an airport consultant here in Kelowna. Hello, Hannah. Thank you, Ashley. That was so interesting. I'm just going to share my screen to start a presentation here. All right. So the first thing I'm going to start with here is the video from the Elevate Inspire um, gala from the last one that happened since before the pandemic. Um, talks a little bit about sort of what I do right now, and then I'll get a bit more into my story about sort of how I got there. I'm Laura Oh, you guys can't hear the video. Um, I'm not sure. It doesn't have subtitles. I guess I can just skip the video if we can't hear the sound. Um, that's probably not as good without me speaking. So I'll just keep going if that's okay. All right, well, I'll talk a bit about sort of what I do now. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, I run my own business. And what I do generally is airport consulting. And so my main customer with my airport consulting is the city of Kelowna. I'm just going to stop this for a second. And then I'll go to the next slide. There we go. 
Um, so what I do is I compile safety data. So there's requirements from the government to have a safety management system, which means that you basically have to proactively identify things within the airport that could lead to an accident or an incident. And we look at that from a really holistic point of view. So that's in Kelowna, really from when anyone arrives driving into the airport to sort of when they leave. We look at all of the safety hazards that happen in that sort of process. So how I started is I was a math and science lover in when I was in school. Um, and a lot of my teachers encouraged me to go into engineering. And I knew that engineering wasn't really that female dominated, um, but I still decided to go into it. And I thought the hardest engineering to do would probably be aerospace engineering. So I decided to go into aerospace engineering and this is me here. You guys didn't get the video, so you won't get as much of a tour of all my hairstyles throughout the year, but here's one to start. Um, so this is my graduating class and without having to zoom in on anyone too much, you can tell there weren't that many women in the class. So at the time that I graduated, aerospace engineering female enrollment was around nine to 15 percent so that means I was sort of about one in ten within my class out of the share of people taking the program um, after I graduated from aerospace engineering I moved out to Kelowna and I got a job working at a repair and maintenance facility as an aerospace engineer so this is the Convair aircraft that I worked on and what I would basically do is that we were the OEM for these aircraft, which is the original equipment manufacturer. So that means that we essentially were the, like the Boeing of these aircraft because they were no longer being manufactured. So anyone that was still flying them, if they needed a part replaced, we would have to figure out how to manufacture that part and make it and get it sent out to those aircraft. Um, a lot of times, though, we were dealing with drawings from 1950 and very different manufacturing processes. So a lot of what I had to do was look at how we could take that old manufacturing process and update it to current standards. And some of it was very research heavy because we had to find things to replace fabrics that were very specific to certain manufacturers that don't exist anymore. So I did a lot of what's kind of called obsolescence management while I was doing that. And then through there, I sort of moved on to, I didn't like, I liked solving the engineering problems, but I saw so many bigger problems that I wanted to solve that were more sort of business problems. So I moved into what's called quality assurance. And there I was an auditor. And so what we're really doing as auditors is going around and finding, looking at all of the processes and ensuring that we're maintaining quality. So this is kind of the quality triangle. And basically, anytime you're going to reduce time or cost, you're going to also reduce quality. Um, so I wanted to always make sure that that side of the triangle was big enough. However, in doing that, I sort of I did lots of training and I found out lots of new things that I really liked project management and business analysis. And um, I started doing some training for that. And then I was looking for opportunities within the company I was working for and didn't really manage to find anything that was where I wanted to go. So I left that company and I actually moved out of aviation for a little while. I worked with a company called Accelerate Okanagan that works with entrepreneurs in tech companies trying to accelerate their business. And so what I've highlighted here is sort of the phase of entrepreneurs that I was working with. So we were working with entrepreneurs that were sort of coming in with a, a company that was, you know, um, kind of a little bit beyond an idea, but they didn't necessarily have a lot of things established yet. And then we were helping them get to a point where they could actually sell their product in the market. So in doing that, I got a little bit of a taste of entrepreneurial work. And I ended up part of my story. Uh, it was a nonprofit. And so sometimes that's what happens with nonprofits in the way that their budgets work. Um, so I wasn't really needed there anymore. And I was let go. And I was sort of left lost with not knowing quite what to do. 
Um, but I had all these amazing opportunities to meet people who were entrepreneurs and I learned a lot about entrepreneurship. Um, and I just wanted to share a little bit because there's also sort of an underrepresentation of women that are entrepreneurs as well. So the good news is that today, 50% of all businesses are started by women, which is awesome. But when we look at only 15.6% of small medium enterprises, so that's sort of like small medium businesses are owned by women and 92.7% of those have less than 20 employees. And that's sort of where I sit. I am like a micro business. Um, and what I do is mainly around data and around building audits. And it's a job that I didn't really know existed before I went to school. And I probably would have loved it um, because I work numbers, I build lots of graphs. And to some people that doesn't sound exciting, but it is to me. And just as sort of a turnaround, I actually, after I started doing my consulting business, I ended up becoming a, um, a writer, <laughs> an author, and sort of a liaison for the company that I ended up getting fired from. So we can all see that sometimes something that, turn, that we think might be bad can turn out to be the best thing that ever happens to us. And so that's how I sort of started building my business. And yeah, it's called Curiosity Analysis and Consulting. And it's sort of based around the fact that I'm always curious about things and I'm always trying to find ways to build things in a better way and look at things in a different way and sort of present data in a way that people can understand it and use that to make decisions in their business. And that is all I have. Sorry about the video, we should have tested that before, I guess. <laughs> no worries at all. Thank you so much, Laura. That was awesome. I feel like I even learned a bunch about that as well. Um, awesome. So next up, I'd like to welcome Chelsea. Uh, she's going to speak about her job as a manager of health, safety and environment at Air Canada. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for jumping on today and learning a little bit more about all the aviation careers uh, Canada has to offer. And Laura, thank you so much for your presentation, kind of being in the same field. It's so nice to have people like you that deal with the technical side and the audit side, because that's something I don't like doing. I'd rather be out in the field. So th thank you. We need people like you. I'm going to share my screen with you guys. So I have a presentation as well. Expand it for everybody. All right. So I'm Chelsea Wright. Thank you for being here again. And Hannah, thank you for the introduction. So with my title, Health, Safety and Environment Manager, nobody really knows what I do. So I'm going to try and explain it the best I can and make sure I break it down on what I do, how to get there, and some advice for everyone watching. So a manager of health and safety is the person who ensures every worker, passenger, building, and landscape is free from hazards, emergencies, and liability issues. So when we think about flying on an airplane or walking through an airport, a lot of the times we have tunnel vision and we just think we get out of our car, we walk through the airport terminal, we get on the plane. We don't actually understand the entire business model that goes into it. There's hundreds of different buildings that make an airport operate correctly. There's hundreds of different buildings that an airline has to own to operate effectively. And all these locations have to be strategically placed to make sure that this operations run smoothly. Uh, these buildings and spaces also need hundreds of people to run them effectively. And I, I'm responsible for making sure that the health, safety and environment is looked after for all these people in all these buildings. So what does a day in the life look like? Um, the picture in the top right corner there of me is actually me putting out an ashtray fire with a rubber boot while talking on the phone, dealing with a workplace incident. So I'd like to say that health and safety is very uh, streamlined and you always know, always know what's gonna happen, but definitely not. Uh, sometimes you might be walking outside for your lunch break and there's a fire that you have to put out literally um, on the phone and in the ashtray. Uh, you also get to experience inc incredible views everywhere you go. 
everywhere you go, you're dealing with new airports, new airlines, new cargo buildings, and you also get to meet really incredible, incredible, incredible people. So this gentleman here uh, is one of our maintenance techs out of Halifax, Nova Scotia, and turns out I worked with his brother in Edmonton, and we've dealt with each other on a daily basis. Had no idea that that was even his brother. So aviation gets to take you all across Canada and have really cool experiences. But more on the formal side, day to day, I develop policies and procedures for um, human resources, hazard management, risk management, and general business policies. I look into incident investigations. So if one of our employees get hurt, whether that's falling down in the parking lot or they cut their finger when they're using a miter saw, I have to do a complete incident investigation on that. How can we make sure that that's not gonna happen again and that all of our employees can go home safe at the end of the day? I do a lot of training and development. Incidents happen because there's a lack of training and a lot of new people that are coming on need training to be successful in anything that they're doing. So at least once a week, I am standing in front of someone delivering presentations, helping them be the best person that they can be and be successful in their career. Inspections of buildings and environmental systems. So kind of like Laura was speaking about, aviation has lots of regulations and it requires lots of auditing. Auditing and inspections tie into each other perfectly. And if we don't keep up on these inspections, we, we're gonna have incidents down the road and we're never gonna be sure of actually how well we're doing because we have nothing to benchmark with. So it can be something as, in, as simple as, has the fire extinguisher in our office, been, office building been checked off and certified to something more critical, like a wastewater management system um, for our entire airport city. Relationship building. So I'll get more into this when I talk about my career um, and how to be successful, but relationship building is huge in safety. Uh, you're one of those people that needs a lot of trust from your group. So daily, you have to keep up with relationships with every single department you're working with. Documentation of situations. So in health and safety, there is a lot of documentation. There is a lot of admin work, and that's because there's a lot of legal and liability issues around health and safety. Um, if anyone is familiar with workers' compensation boards in British Columbia or in Alberta, you know that everything has to be documented, and this is for the better good of all of our employees. Emergency planning. So this is one of my favorite things to do. Um, I'll kind of give you guys the big picture. Think about you're flying into an airport. Um, the plane's nose gear, so the wheel on the front, may not come down because of a mechanical issue. This plane is going to have to land on our runway with a skid landing. So how can I make sure that this plane is going to land safely and that everyone on board is going to be safe? So a lot of the times we do our emergency planning based on scenarios like this. So we will actually have full incident mock-ups with a bunch of volunteers. We will fake an incident. We will get all the RCMP, all the medics, all the county uh, volunteers surrounding us, and we'll put us all together and we'll fake an incident to make sure that when this happens in real life, because it does happen, unfortunately, that we are 100% prepared. And lastly, construction safety. So if you are familiar with the aviation industry, there is a lot of new construction happening. Aviation is one of the biggest uh, new industries in Alberta and it keeps building and building and building. And it's, I think it will be one of the top industries in the next three years. So they have a lot of con contractors on site. Those people need to be managed on a health and safety perspective. So are they fully orientated and are they trained to do the job safely? Are they following all our rules and regulations? That's something that I get to oversee as well. And then moving on to me, so how did I become a safety professional? So I grew up in central Alberta, small little farming community. I grew up on a dairy farm with my parents and I had the choice. I could either take over the farm and continue to milk cows for the rest of my life, which don't get me wrong, it's a wonderful way of life, but it is a lot of work. Or I could venture into something completely different. When I was in high school, I started volunteering on our local fire department, which was Vegable Fire Department Emergency Services. I loved this so much. Sometimes I would skip math class to respond to a vehicle accident on the highway and my teachers would be so upset with me, but the skills and the experience I was learning from that vehicle accident was gonna outweigh anything I learned in my math class. And I was so 
glad that I got to be a part of that team. So when I was with those volunteer fire departments, I learned that there's a lot of hazards that could be prevented before an accident happens, whether that's a vehicle accident or a house fire or a medical emergency. And being a firefighter, it was very stressful and I had to make that decision. Did I wanna work in a high stress, high pace environment, working shift work, especially living in a big city? Or did I wanna be on the prevention side of things and be proactive? So I made the decision to be proactive and move into an occupational health and safety role. So with that decision, I uh, signed up for my occupational health and safety certificate at the University of Alberta. Uh, this was in 2013. And at this time, this was the number one program in Canada. And it was also the only developed program at that time. Since then, they have developed an occupational health and safety diploma. So this is kind of one step up. And to get your diploma, you have to have your certificate first. So I'm glad that's the route I chose. But as you guys know, when you are looking for a new career, uh, people want you to have at least five you know, to eight years experience before they're hiring you on in a position like this. So I said, how can I get the experience while doing my school so that when I finish my schooling, I don't come out without a job? So at that time in Alberta, the oil and gas industry was booming. There was a lot of jobs. There was a lot of opportunities for young women. And I decided to jump on that. So I flew up to Peace River, actually leaving Edmonton International Airport for the first time. And I started my job in Alberta Oil and Gas. And the people there mentored me and made me into what I am today. That oil and gas life uh, is definitely very demanding and high stress, working 21 days on, seven days off. I knew I had to make a transition if I wanted to have a more work-life balance. There was a posting at Edmonton International Airport for a safety advisor role. And I applied and I was lucky enough to be hired on. And that's where my first job in aviation started. And I've never looked back. That was six years ago. And aviation has literally turned my life upside down and made it everything it can be for the better. I've met so many amazing, or sorry, so many amazing young women and mentors throughout this journey in aviation. And I don't think I'll ever turn back. From there, I actually decided to upgrade my schooling and com complete my diploma in occupational health and safety. And I've finished that recently. And then within the last eight months, I've joined the Air Canada team and taken on a leadership role from which I've been talking about today, manager of health, safety and environment. So with that being said, some tips for starting a career in aviation safety. So obviously you can do health and safety in any kind of industry all over the world, but specifically for aviation safety, it is very specific and we want to make sure the people in these roles are successful. So if this is something that interests you, definitely find a mentor, um, you know, sit with them on a regular basis, job shadowing, have weekly phone calls, go for coffee, just get a feel for what that person really does. And if that's something that interests you. Uh, look at University of Alberta and University of New Brunswick websites. They have really great descriptions of what it means to be an occupational health and safety professional. And they also have really good links on how you would build into that career and how you would sign up for their courses. Their courses can be done full time or online, which is great. So you can be working while doing your school and you can still gain that experience. Um, being a safety professional, there is a lot of times when you have to deliver a message people may not want to hear. Sometimes you may not be the most liked person in the room. So there is a confidence factor. You have to have a backbone and you have to be very strong in your message of legality and importance of workplace safety. If you don't have a backbone and you don't have the confidence, you aren't gonna do well in this role. And experience, I can't reference this enough. Definitely go out and get the work experience in any kind of industry and gain everything you can from the people around you, whether that's a carpenter, a financial assistant, um, you know, ex executive leaders, any kind of position, take knowledge from them and apply it to yourself. And that will definitely help you in the health and safety role. You're not gonna be an expert on every trade in every industry, but if you can have an oversight of these roles, you can definitely apply that into your day-to-day -day practice. And lastly, relationship building. So I kind of touched on this before, but health and safety is all about trusting your employees and them trusting you. They want to know that if 
anything goes wrong, you're going to be the one there to help them. And they're, they're going to feel supported throughout that journey. So daily, I'm having relationship building conversations, coffee meetings, catch up meetings, and doing a lot of networking to make sure that my presence is known and that I'm getting as much insight as I can from my employees. And just that last piece of advice, um, this can go for aviation, it can also go for any industry. Everybody knows someone, it's such a small world. So always make sure that you're giving 110% in everything you do. You never know when you're gonna be sitting on an airplane, sitting in a restaurant, applying for a job, and that person may be your, may be your old boss's friend, they may be a cousin of someone you used to work with, they may be the flight instructor for your, your new uh, pilot student. So make sure that you keep 100% um, close ties with everything you do and give 110%. And that is all I have. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And yes, I will vouch for that as well. That piece of advice, take it and run with it. That is very true. We are now going to go into a little question period. So I'll just remind all of our attendees, if you have any questions, just pop them in the little Q&A box down below. And I'm going to pass it over to Katie, who's going to be running our question and answer period. Thanks, Hannah. Um, first question I have is for Ashley. Uh, you were talking about search and rescue and how it's, um, I guess it's the JRCC, sorry, and uh, how they have to be notified if people or pilots or aircraft are after their alerting time. How do you collect and store that information to ensure that you can get in touch with uh, those pilots? So to get in touch with the pilot, sorry. So where we get that information from? Yeah, like how do you collect it and how do you store it? So the first place to look is on our flight plan. We usually have some type of contact information. So that's always the first place to check. And then I'm also documenting when it comes to search and rescue, I'm documenting everything that I've looked into, who I call and what time I do it. And then, um, so on the screens that I have access to, we have a list of all the companies, all the numbers, all the facilities in BC, all of their numbers. Um, and then we have access to this website called FCOM, which is I can look up any site in BC and it'll give me a list of like what the airport number is, what the fuel, like the fueling station number is. So it's just using whatever resources that may potentially be there. And um, if worse comes to worse, if there's nothing there, we also, the our local RCMP number, because if we may need them to do the field search if need be. And okay. it's, that's kind of, that's the last resort. Hopefully we try to get people to provide a phone number and a search and rescue number of someone that we can call. Uh, in case we cannot locate them, but that's not always the case. And sometimes we're trying to find company, looking up, it's just whatever resources we can find. Sometimes it's even I'm looking up the ident on the internet. It's, yeah, yeah it's just whatever we can think of, but uh, yeah. And it's just documenting everything we've done, what we've looked up, who we've spoken to at what time. And then if we do get to that point to pass it on to the JRCC, they have more resources than we do. And it's uh, cause I know there's kind of that connotation like, oh no, we haven't been able to find them, we passed them on, but that's a part of the process. And they are usually able to locate them relatively quickly. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that is the process that we follow and kind of the sequencing with that. Okay. And can you expand a little bit more about um, the JRCC itself, so it rescue cancel. So, what so are they, they are in really charge in charge of coordinating of? any search and rescue? Like, I haven't, knock on wood, I haven't had to deal with them myself yet. Yeah. Uh, everything's been found, but it's uh, they are in charge of search and rescue for anything in the air or on the water, and it's so for either medium that that is kind of the last resort. And I know they're based off the island and. Again, it's not something I've looked into because I haven't had to. I hope I don't have to. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, Laura, I have a question for you. Um, so you talked a little bit about with being an airport consultant. Um, you, you talked uh, about the safety management system. Do you also get involved in like land use and future planning of you know expansions and that kind of stuff? Is that part of your job as well or are you more focused on safety? 
I'm mostly focused on safety, but like Chelsea mentioned, I'm a, I have a little bit of a different sort of, I guess, not as boots on the ground, not as out there. In I'm more sort of behind the scenes calculating all the data um, and presenting that in a way. So the way that we do that is we look at it's really more of a risk management system than safety management. So we look okay. at what's sort of the risk level of different things happening and then how many events, whether they're incidents or hazards, are kind of related to that category. So um, I do a lot of stuff around data analysis and I always, people always think it's rocket science. That's kind of a joke because <laughs> I am a rocket scientist when I'm taking aerospace engineering, but um, it's not generally really that difficult. It's just about coming up with categories and then putting things into those categories. And that's sort of how you look at the data to look at sort of how many things are in this category. So for example, a category would be parking lots. So how many sort of different reports do we have related to parking lots? What's sort of the risk of having parking lots at the airport? Um, what's the risk of an aircraft malfunction? Obviously that's gonna be a higher risk than, <laughs> than a parking lot, um, but how many issues are we having with aircraft malfunctions? And then we take that data and we say, okay, well, how do we improve where we're really having a lot of incidents or where we're having high risk things come up as hazards frequently? Um, and then we use that data to sort of build the objectives. And so part of the regulated safety management system is actually having safety objectives and being able to measure those safety objectives. So Chelsea touched on it a little bit. If you don't have a benchmark of where to start from, um, then how do you know if you're doing better? And um, so what I try to do is create that benchmark and then also set the goals around how are we going to improve that and what are we looking to see that we improve because that has a little twofold to it. It's both making sure we're acti acting on things and putting policies and procedures in place um, and then measuring it and making sure that what we're measuring is relevant because... <laughs> For example, with COVID, um, if we were just measuring how many things happened, um, you don't always get the right perspective. So you really want to know, like, for example, things that happen on the apron, um, if it has to do with marshalling, then you want to relate it to how many aircraft ground movements you've had. Because if you're just counting marshalling accidents, well, if you only had four flights leave and you had four incidents, then that's not a very good track record. Whereas if you had a hundred flights leave and you had four incidents, it's a different track record. So what I really try to do is take that data and put it into perspective so that when I'm talking to the management team, they can understand and I can really back up what I'm saying of, you know, we're having a lot of issues with marshalling. And last year we only had, you know, one incident per hundred departures. And this year we've had four incidents per hundred departures. We need to get that back down again. Okay, so you do a lot of that analytical studies and stuff, so you can be proactive um, about issues as they come up. So yes, yeah. Um, Chelsea, question for you is: you talk a lot about relationship building and how that's so important to your career. And one of the things you said was um, building, like relationship building conversations. How do you approach that? Like, what would that look like for you? Yeah, so this can be really different for anyone, but the approach I've always took is start with a personal level. So let's get to know you personally. Like, Let's know about your family. Let's know about your children. Let's know what you like to do on the weekend. As soon as you make it personal, that empl employee or you know the group that you're working with really starts to trust you. And it, it also makes um, you want to attend their, uh, their work, I'd say meetings more because now you have a personal interest in what's going on with them. So when we're talking about safety, I want to make sure that employee is going home safe at the end of the day because I know they have three children or I know they're working on a really big school project that they want to finish. And a lot of people nowadays are lacking that personal and social aspect. So if I can be that person to provide that relationship with them at work, I think it'll make them that much more excited to come to work and that much more, um, I guess, dedicated to the to the safety of themselves and their employees around them. Yeah, I like to try and have those conversations with the people I work with and find out more about them. <laughs> 
it does. It makes it more fun to go to work for sure when you actually know who you're working with and you build those relationships. So a um, question for all of you, and let's start with Ashley, is what has been your favorite work experience so far? Uh, my favorite work experience. So I only got to work live traffic for a month before I had to stop my training for ATC. But uh, in that moment, um, I had I got to control the snowbirds. Uh, they were flying down to Comox and they were flying through the airspace that I was sitting in and working that day. And for me, that was a very, I mean, I was trying to contain, I was sitting with a training supervisor that day too, not even my regular on the job instructor. And I was just like, no, be calm, be calm. But to me, that was because I grew up so close to the Abbotsford airport that every August it felt like they were doing the air show for us at our house. Like my sister and I were the kids that had the sandals by the door. As soon as we heard something take off, we, we would run outside and the snowbirds were always a highlight. And uh, to work them, to get the chance to work them was so surreal because I was like, oh my gosh, like I had goosebumps sitting there. I was like, oh, this is so cool. And as soon as I unplugged from that sit, all I did, first thing I do is like call my sister. I'm like, guess what? <laughs> so for me, that was a uh, pretty neat because as that kid watching them fly, it was uh, never in my wildest dreams that I think I'd ever have a career where I'd get to deal with them. And uh, so to me, that was a pretty full circle moment right there. <laughs> Yeah, um, I actually hopefully get to talk to the snowbirds this year. Yes. So <laughs> I may have that feeling too. It was, uh, I, I get excited still thinking of it. <laughs> so Laura, how about yourself? I actually have two. So one would be sort of my first real like, I guess, eureka moment in aviation. And that was I was jump seating on the Convair, um, flying from Vancouver back into Kelowna. And it was like this beautiful sunrise that we were flying over. And I was sitting in the jump seat, which in the Convair is just a little thing that you pull out. It's not even a seat. It's like a, a little tray, basically, <laughs> that you sit on. But you sit right between the pilots. And so I could see out the window. And I was like, I've designed things on this very aircraft that I'm flying on. And it was just a really neat experience. And then another neat experience in a totally different direction is Chelsea talked about the emergency planning. And I participated two times in the emergency exercise at Kelowna. Um, the first time I was a family and friend of someone who was on the aircraft. And so I had to come in and act all worried and ask about them. And then the second year they did it, I said, can I be one of the people on the aircraft? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, can I be one of the most severely injured people? So we actually had to go early um, and get makeup done so that we looked like crash victims. And then we were sitting on the plane and I was a I had a leg injury so my hips were broken so I had like makeup showing my hips broken and um they had smoke on the plane and it was actually kind of a scary situation but I was the person who had to be carried out by the firefighters so I had to be on the stretcher and they had to carry me out of the plane um and then I had to go in the ambulance but it was just a really interesting experience I mean something you hope you never experience in real life but um, just getting to sort of be there and see that and see everyone working together. And um, it was really, really cool, despite the fact it's a little bit of a gruesome scenario. But um, yeah, if we don't do those things, then, you know, we don't have the plans in place. And it is more likely people are going to get injured or not get to the hospital in time and all of that. So just seeing how that all worked and getting to sort of be a part of it was really cool as well. That's pretty awesome yeah those uh, exercises are crucial for safety and ensure that everything goes smoothly and uh, Chelsea how about yourself what's your finger favorite work experience yeah I, I'd say it's more of a couple a few memories so um I'll speak to this as don't stop doubting your or don't ever stop doubting yourself and keep surprising yourself every day that's how I'll go into it but I remember going up into Peace River, my first job, and I'm sitting on this little eight passenger plane. And you know what, I'm sitting there, I'm 18 years old, and I'm thinking, wow, I made it. I get to fly on an airplane to work. And I was so excited and, you know, just put it into perspective. And then I get hired on at Edmonton International Airport and I'm sitting in my office tower and I literally have a 360 degree view of the entire runway and the entire airspace. And I say, wow, you know what, I made it. I get to see planes land every single day. 
And then moving into my new role, uh, they're flying me out to Montreal on a weekly basis and they get to put me in first class every single time I fly out there. And I, I sit back and I think, wow, I think I made it. I think this is it. And I hope that I get to keep experiencing that on a different level every single time. So just whenever you're in a career and you may not like it, put it into perspective that it will get better. And in that moment, it's probably the greatest thing that's going to happen to you. So on those words, um, because that's really great advice. So what is the best advice that you guys could offer somebody that wants to get into the aviation industry? And we can start with uh, Chelsea, if you want to continue and then go from there. Yeah, hard work. Um, Never stop giving 110%. Like I said, you know what, if you have to put in an extra two hours every day, or you have to attend meetings on a weekend, or you have to show up to an incident at 6 a.m., never stop putting in that work because it will go, it will be recognized and people will see that. And that's what will get you farther in your career. So just work as hard as you can and never stop. It's really good advice. And how about Laura, what advice would you give? I would say networking and finding people and also persistence. Um, You know, any job I've gotten, I've gotten because I like basically haven't accepted no for an answer in a way. Um, And it's obviously there's a line of not being annoying, but I know a lot of people when they apply for jobs, and this is one thing I tell young people all the time is that, you know, just submitting your application is one thing, but you need to do something to make yourself stand out. And whether that's doing something interesting with your application or just like doing the research and going on LinkedIn and finding who the manager is and sending them a little message, because at least maybe your name then stands out when they get to that pile of resumes. And I think a lot of people get really intimidated and think, oh, I well, I applied. So if they want me, they'll call me. But if you really want the job, then it's about you also making sure they know how bad you want it because no one, like everyone wants an employee that really wants to work hard and really wants the job because that's the person who, like Chelsea said, is gonna give 110%. So um, just even giving that 110% before you get the job and really like trying to make yourself stand out and being persistent. Good advice, thanks. And Ashley, do you have any advice? Just. Uh... Always be willing to learn. Um, aviation is just such a vast industry in general and one that involves safety in every aspect of it. And there's so many rules and regulations. And I feel that coming into this field, it is a steep learning curve in every aspect of it. There's certain terminology and just the practices that are applied. And you're constantly learning. It's steep at first, but even as you go on, there's just so many things and technology evolves and you have to relearn things. And it's just never stop learning always have that drive to learn because it'll take you far definitely good advice so thank you everybody for your wonderful answers and i'm going to turn it back over to hannah awesome thanks guys and that was some awesome advice I would like to say a big thank you to Ashley, Laura, and Chelsea for taking the time to participate in the cross-country tour this year, and thank you to all of our attendees for being here. If you have any further questions about what you heard today, please send us an email. The email address is info at elevateaviation.ca. Don't forget to visit the Elevate Aviation website for more information on what we do. Thank you, everyone, and have an amazing day.